Everybody say, say that again. Donald yeah. Glover and Childish Gambino. Tom Glover. He's an actor. Comedian. Childish Gambino. Yeah. Childish Gambino. Yeah. Yeah. It's Donald Glover. He's the dude from the community. Yeah, yeah Donald Glover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> So, um, today we're going to finish up what we were talking about um, regarding boundary layers last time and then uh, get into the, um, the aspects of lift and drag that you uh, need to know uh, for intuitive questions on the homework. Uh, just some of the basics of lift and drag, which we'll finish up during our last lecture on Monday. So last time, we talked about uh, the exact theory, or the theoretical solution to uh, the laminar boundary layer equations, uh, coming up with what we call the Blasius solution. Uh, the Blasius solution is a self-similar solution in that it says, if we take the velocity profile at different points um, on a flat plate with different Reynolds numbers, uh, different boundary layer thicknesses, and we say, that uh, you, of course. We say that uh, that little u of the free stream velocity is equal to some function of y over the boundary layer thickness. And this tells us that if we take slices at different points along in the boundary layer, we're going to get a different profile because the boundary layer uh, is, is uh, changing thickness. However, if we scale the velocity distributions using this sort of dimensional analysis, we plot u over u as a function of um, something that has to do with this y over delta. Uh, and then what we end up with is all of these velocity profiles collapsing onto each other. So this is what we refer to as a self-similar solution in the same way that we talked about modeling similarity. 
maintaining equality of <coughs> dimensionless parameters. Uh, here, if we use the right dimensionless parameters, all the boundary layers, uh, velocity profiles look identical. So uh, from this kind of uh, uh, fr from this uh, construct of how the boundary layer flow occurs, we said next that unfortunately, um, in order to solve for this shape here, uh, we ended up with a third order ordinary differential equation, something that's not actually um, solvable analytically, you know, you can't write down the solution. So what people have done instead is they have used uh, just computer programs, things like um, MATLAB and, and or, or your choice, any, any sort of computer code to numerically integrate this. In other words, to find the area um, under the curve of, of uh, so to find F, F prime, and f double prime as functions of so in other words they integrate along eta to find each of these quantities and then they put together a list or table of values so eta f f prime f double prime which we simply use as a lookup table so the idea here is since f prime here is defined as u over u, this is usually the quantity that we're actually interested in. So if we wanted to plot out the velocity profile, we would simply go to each point in the velocity. We would say, all right, I'm interested in a certain eta value of 1, for example. Go in here, eta equals 1. Our velocity is 33% of the free stream velocity. And so you could figure out what dimensional distance eta corresponds to by knowing what position you're at on the plate, what the pre-stream velocity and viscosity are, and uh, you can rescale your velocity profile from this. Um, so, we also said that uh, the boundary layer thickness is a little bit hard to define, right? There's no, um, in a purely theoretical sense, the velocity in the boundary layer never actually completely reaches the free stream velocity because it's always getting dragged back by slower moving particles closer to the plate. So there's this asymptotic approach to the free stream velocity, but it's never, you know, exactly um, the same as the free stream velocity. So uh, in order to pick something that we can consistently call the boundary layer thickness, we said that um, we defined something equal to delta 0.99. And this is sort of a standard uh, choice of boundary layer thickness. And this is defined uh, such that u y evaluated at delta 0 0.99 is equal to 0 0.99 so free stream velocity. Or in other words, that u over u is equal to 0 0.99. So if we take this, and we come over here, and we start looking up where we hit a value of 0 0.99, bam, right here. We run over here. This tells us that an eta, a dimensionless thickness of uh, when, when, for a given u and uh, viscosity in x, uh, the boundary layer thickness is this value y, such that eta is equal to 5. So what this tells us is that eta is equal to delta 0 0.99 is um, u over x right, is equal to 5, or in other words, that delta 0 0.99 can be solved as 5 over the square root of the Reynolds number. I'm um, sorry, x. If we factor an x out here, um, so this is one of the fundamental uh, ways of scaling boundary layer thickness. And it's uh, nice because it's a good clean number. It sort of reproduces the, um, it, it comes from this exact theory, right? So it's, it, it's theoretically sound. It does what we expect it to in terms of as the Reynolds number goes up, the boundary layer thickness relative to, you know, x would be some distance along the body. So it tells us that the boundary layer thickness relative to the size of the body decreases. 
In other words, boundary layers get thinner relative to the body that they're on. Um, so we have delta 0 0.99 over x is equal to square root 1 over Reynolds number x. And then finally, I uh, introduced the idea of, uh, sorry, the boundary layer height. And finally, uh, then we introduced the idea of the displacement thickness and the momentum thickness. And remember, the displacement thickness uh, is the, the sort of, these are both kind of abstract concepts, but uh, the displacement thickness is the amount of free stream flow that would have to be removed in order to, uh, for the external flow of the body to have the same amount of mass flow. In other words, it's some thickness um, of fluid at the inviscid flow velocity, a big U, uh, that contains the same mass flow rate as whatever, as the, as the slowed down fluid in the viscous boundary layer. Um, and we define that as this delta star, I'm going to write them over here because we'll be referring to them later. It's equal to 1.721 over square root of the Reynolds number x. So we can see, um, oops, sorry, this is supposed to be, but, um, so we can see right now that uh, the ratio of real boundary layer thickness, or of the, the, the dimensional boundary layer thickness to this displacement thickness is constant. It's about, uh, you know, it's about one to three. And then finally, the momentum thickness is the, uh, the thickness of a layer fluid at, this, at the free stream velocity, big U, that contains the same momentum flux, if we did a control volume analysis, right? Contains the same momentum flux as is removed from the fluid by the viscosity of the boundary layer. And so if we were to consider, um, sort of, if we had a, if we compared two velocity profiles, right? A viscous velocity profile that has a boundary layer and an inviscid velocity profile. In order for them to have the same amount of momentum flux between the surface and off to infinity, on this one we would have to remove some thickness of fluid, which we call big theta, right? In other words, the velocity inside of this layer would have to be set equal to zero in order for the momentum flux of these two velocities to be the same. And as a result of the change in momentum flux, this means that if we remove this fluid, or this, this, uh, if we remove this uh, thickness, or set the velocity equal to zero inside this thickness, then what we're going to get is the same uh, drag, on, or the same force being applied to the control volume. And this we scale with big theta over x is equal to, is it 0 0.664? Yeah. 0 0.664 over the square root of Reynolds number of x. So we can see again, all of these scale with one over the, the inverse of the square root of the Reynolds number. Right? So we can see that they all get smaller as the, as the Reynolds number increases um, relative to the, uh, the, the size of the body they're on. And we also see that they are all, you know, they, they're all proportional to one another. Um, the boundary layer thickness is about three times the, uh, the displacement thickness, the displacement thickness is about two and a half, between two and a half and three times the, uh, as thick as the momentum thickness. So what this looks like on a plate the uniform inflow is This is the thickness of our boundary layer, the 99% thickness. <coughs> this would be delta star. Uh, different colors 
to use, and then this would be. Yes. So if we wanted, in other words, if we were to do a, if we were to take a control volume, do a control volume analysis that goes from the surface of the plate here out to, you know, out to infinity, and then back down to some point on the surface of the plate. Then doing, uh, if we were to do conservation of mass through this control volume, through this control surface and this control surface, uh, we simply call this A, A, that was B, B, right? The only, um, the only inflow and outflow on this imaginary control volume that goes up to infinity is through these two vertical <coughs> surfaces. Uh, the, in order to maintain conservation of mass, if we wanted to say that the, the um, if we want to ignore this velocity gradient in the, in the boundary layer, is to thicken the body or remove flow inside this delta star. And if we wanted to maintain the same amount of force on this control volume while treating it as an inviscid flow, we would remove some amount of fluid, some thickness of fluid equal to big theta here, uh, or the momentum thickness. Um, and derivations of how to get delta star and momentum thickness are all over the place, uh, including in your book. Um, and so from, you know, from these quantities, we can also kind of keep going and say, all right, while shear stress, we know that it's just be for a laminar flow, uh, tau w is simply equal to uh, du dy evaluated at y equals to zero, which Uh, ends up being equal to the quantity shown here, uh, 0 0.332 u to the 3 halves power rho mu x, which I prefer to write out actually as, um, let me double check to make sure I have this correct. to uh, make this a 2, put a u in here, um, yeah, move a row down here and out here, so it can be written as 0 0.332 row u squared square root 1 over Reynolds number x. Um, which means that if we uh, want to write the what's called the coefficient of friction here, which is just the shear stress divided by the dynamic pressure. Remember, this says units of pressure, force per unit area. Um, this one half row u squared here is what we call the dynamic pressure. It has the same units. So if we non-dimensionalize our shear stress into a coefficient of friction, we see that by dividing one half row u squared out of it. Um, we simply, rho u squared gets cancelled out, one half on the bottom doubles this, and we end up with CF is equal to 0 0.664 over the square root of the Reynolds number with respect to x. All right. Um, so, what I want to do today is get through what we call the momentum integral equations. Um, and then I'm going to uh, quickly describe uh, the, not necessarily go, go into lift and drag very deeply, but at least introduce the idea of lift and drag coefficients and sort of the quantities that go into those. Uh, I think there are a couple problems on the homework that involve computing something like an area or speed or drag using information about the lift and drag coefficients. So I just want to give you the necessary information uh, for that. So anyway, um, the uh, momentum integral equations, or the momentum integral equation, also called the, the Karman, von Karman momentum integral equation, is a really nice uh, theoretical approach that we can kind of use as an alternative to Blasius solution. The Blasius solution is exact, right? It satisfies the theory. We, we derived the exact form of the boundary layer uh, 
the boundary layer equations from Navier-Stokes um, using this sort of order of magnitude analysis. We said these quantities are really small, they can be cut out, and sort of by this logical progression, we arrived at a simplified set of equations that led us to the exact solution for boundary layer profiles using the self-similarity condition. The problem is that it's not, like, it's, it's, uh, it's still laborious, you know, the, the boundary layer equations are unsolvable um, it, it, without the use of a computer to generate those, that table of, uh, of uh, f as a function of eta, and it's uh, only valid for laminar flows. So instead, um, we have this alternative approach that's a little bit more robust and a little bit easier to apply, but doesn't give us quite as much detail, all right? Uh, so this is what we call the integral equation, and, or the momentum integral equation. Um, and it involves, just as you might expect for anything that involves momentum, uh, control volume. So if we consider a control volume like this, similar to the way we defined a control volume here, uh, and we write the momentum flux through here, then what we end up getting is... Uh, make sure that I'm on the side. <coughs> that by applying a conservation of linear momentum inside this control volume, we can write that, you know, the drag, essentially the entire, uh, all the force on this control volume is a result of uh, the shear stress along the wall integrated over the area of the plate and can be written using this conservation of linear momentum and integrated to yield this expression right here. Such that the drag is equal to <coughs> drag is equal to rho v integral from zero delta mu mu minus u dy. Right. Um, So, in other words, uh, instead of solving for a velocity profile, the velocity profile is what kind of uh, gets is an input to this version of the uh, boundary layer analysis. We the general progression here is that you we um, we will assume a velocity profile u and use the momentum deficit created by that velocity profile through a boundary, through a control volume in order to pull out the drag, which we can relate to the shear stress on the plate. Um, and then through some other theoretical analysis, we can use that to get the boundary layer thickness, displacement thickness, or momentum thickness. And in fact, because of this way we've written um, the deficit in uh, momentum, we can immediately see that it is related to this boundary layer, uh, or so related to this momentum thickness, big theta, such that um, the drag here, if we were to factor a u out here, uh, we would end up with rho b big u squared one. So if we were to, for example, go into our, uh, the, that lookup table from the Blasius solution, and we were to integrate from zero to whatever our boundary layer thickness is, you know, we were to pick a boundary layer and integrate through where eta is equal to five, and plug in um, numerically the values of u over big U, our dimensionless velocity profile, what we would get is an exact estimate of the drag. Um, but that's not what we're interested in. We want to say, for example, um, what happens if the velocity profile is not necessarily laminar? What happens if uh, we don't, you know, if we if we don't have that that table of values for uh, the velocity solution right in front of us? You know, we want there's there's this is a approach that is a little bit more um, 
tolerant of not knowing the exact solution. So, so why is this, you know, I've, I've already gotten into one reason why this is useful, is that it's good for both laminar and turbulent flows. Um, but it allows us to make this sort of imprecise estimation of what the drag is based on uh, a reasonable um, function for u uh, on the plate. So I want to quickly, there we go. All right. I'm going to get into a little more detail on this. So uh, that, that version that I just showed you is this is the derivation for if we have a flat plate, right? The nice thing about a flat plate is that the external flow velocity, big U, outside the, velocity, uh, outside the boundary layer is constant. And as a result, if we look at the Bernoulli equation, the pressure is constant along the plate. In other words, um, dp dx is equal to zero in this problem. Uh, the other nice thing about this momentum integral equation compared to the velocity solution, right? this is the only situation in which we can, we can get the velocity solution. But if dp dx is not equal to zero, for example, if our, whatever our body is, has some curvature on it, that forces a velocity gradient along the body's length, then the pressure is going to change. And so if uh, we actually went through and we did the, um, and we did the control volume analysis and we looked at the effect of pressure as well as the change in momentum, what we would get is uh, an, ex an alternate expression that's a little bit more complicated uh, that involves the gradient of u outside the boundary layer. Um, so this this is what the expression would look like, and if we kind of if we look at the uh, the the um, values inside inside of the integral, if we look at these integrals themselves, we would actually see that this is equal to the momentum thickness. This is equal to the displacement thickness. In other words, uh, we have something that says like. Uh, you know, here, this, this here involves the, uh, I guess, the rate at which mass flowing out of the control volume is decreasing uh, along the length, and this would, uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into the physical interpretation of that because I know I'm going to mess it up. Um, so in order to use this, uh, it's kind of a three-step process, okay? Step one is we need to get a first approximation of what the velocity outside the boundary layer is. And so remember um, that we, when we were going through the boundary layer equations last time, we said that uh, we ended up from the, uh, from the y momentum equations, we ended up saying the dp dy is equal to zero. And this was, this didn't, you know, this, this held uh, even if it was not necessarily a flat plate. This, this was just after our first round of canceling out small terms. Um, and the implication here is that if we have, red boundary layer are fine. If we have, um, If we have some pressure outside here, that the pressure is the same on the surface. In other words, the pressure outside the boundary layer dictates the pressure uh, is transmitted directly across the boundary layer and is equal to the pressure on the surface. Now why this is important is because the pressure outside the boundary layer we can get from the velocity using Bernoulli's, the Bernoulli equation. Right? So if we get a good first estimate of u using an inviscid code. For example, if we were to use something like potential flow theory, um, uh, potential flow theory, then we're going to get something that at least roughly approximates uh, the physical free stream velocity outside the boundary layer. Then we apply the Bernoulli equation, we get the pressure distribution outside the boundary layer, and we say because dp dy is equal to zero, then we can just project that, that pressure distribution onto the surface itself. Okay. Um, so that, that, that process of using the Bernoulli equation and projecting the pressure across and saying that the pressure along each of these lines is constant, 
right? That's already been, that's one of the assumptions that's already been built into this version of the equation. And that's why we have these du dx terms here. This re reflects the change in pressure uh, act enacted through the Bernoulli equation. So um, step one is get u of x. Step two is we need to assume some reasonable velocity profile. Uh, that is, we need to pick something We need to pick a function f that gives us a. Uh, I guess if we say we need to pick a function f that gives us a physically reasonable um, u, and the 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 only real constraints here is that it has to satisfy such that u at y evaluated at y equals zero has to be equal to what? In other words, the velocity at the wall. Zero. No slip condition. And u y y equals delta has to be equal to free stream velocity. Now, I know that um, we said that this is never actually true, right? that it never actually reaches the free stream velocity, but just because this is an approximate, um, you know, this is an estimated velocity profile, not the exact solution, then we're, we're okay allowing this to be off by 1%, right? So um, this, you know, there, there, there are a, a ton of different um, velocity profiles we could assume that satisfy these. For example, um, we have our boundary layer. One example could be a velocity profile that looks like this, right? In other words, linear from the wall to the edge of the boundary layer. Okay. Um, others could be uh, things like a, a, a quadratic, or a cubic, or you know, any 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 form of any function of y that keeps these two uh, boundary conditions is acceptable. Um, and then third is you know we plug this in here, we derive an expression for the wall stress, and then depending on the type of flow we have, you know, up up to this point. Um, it's valid for both laminar and turbulent flows, right? Because um, it's just it has just to do with uh, doing a control volume analysis. Um, but beyond this point, if we make some further assumptions, such as uh, saying that the flow is laminar, then we have a, another assumption about uh, the relationship between tau and the velocity profile, and we can actually go take that further, and we can derive um, an expression for delta or the boundary layer thickness. So, what are we doing on time? Yeah, um, I'd like to, we'll, we'll, if we have time at the end, I'd like to come back and do an example with this, a work example. But um, kind of to give you the gist of this, uh, the real, our, our input to the problem, our choice that really goes into the problem, is our choice of, of the velocity profile, right? Um, and the quality of the solution we get out, in other words, how closely it matches the velocity solution or the theoretically exact solution, um, is a function of how much our velocity profile that we cho choose looks like the exact one. For example, um, if this is our velocity, you know, uh, if this is our velocity dist uh, profile, uh, non-dimensionalized y over delta, u over u. Um, if we were to pick something really similar, simple, like this linear one that I drew over there, uh, and we were to plug this into our, um, our uh, control volume, do the momentum deficit, uh, what we would get is uh, that the boundary layer thickness, if we're assuming laminar flow, okay. assuming laminar flow over flat plate, um, then our boundary layer thickness 
is uh, equal to about 3.46 over the square root of the Reynolds number, which is about uh, you know 30% error relative to the exact solution. Which actually, you know, 30% isn't great. That's the 30% error is pretty large. However, um, we get the same form of the solution. In other words, by making this 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 ignoring all of the um, the kind of nastiness of that of those differential equations and just saying I'm going to assume that the velocity uh, varies linearly, then we still get delta is equal to 0 0.346, or, sorry, 3.46, 3.46 over the square root of Reynolds number with respect to x, which has at least the same form as um, the Blasi solution, which is a lot harder to get to. Okay, so this is sort of this. This is meant to demonstrate how, um, by being you know applying theory that we've already covered, the, the, the conservation of linear momentum, and just kind of guessing at the velocity distribution, we can actually get pretty close. Um, if we go a little bit further, and let's say parabolic, right, this is the next the next simplest form of the velocity distribution. Um, then if we assume u over u follows uh, this expression, <coughs> it'll satisfy these boundary conditions and plugging, chugging, we get to something that's only off by about 10% from the exact theoretical solution. Cubic, we're only off by 7%. Seven, seven and if we choose a sine function, you know, something that says if we, uh, if we allow the, dis the velocity distribution between <coughs> here and here to vary um, as a sine wave, then we're off by less than 5% from the exact solution. So this is uh, it's a really powerful tool because the other, you know, the other thing you can do, I didn't see it mentioned in the book, but uh, when I was reviewing this, I was like, oh yeah. Uh, if, for example, you have uh, an experiment, right? Uh, and uh, something like those videos that I showed in the last lecture, um, Right? If we have something like this, if we're running an experiment, and we take a snapshot, you could basically look, take a, a photo here, right? You could snap a photo, um, and you could pick points along here and then just fit a curve through it. Essentially, like put it in Excel, do a curve fit, whatever, um, in order to get some function, ui, and then from that function, you could get the boundary layer thickness, the shear stress, the coefficient of friction, and all of these quantities over here just based on an observed velocity profile. So it's a very powerful tool um, based on pretty simple physics that we've, you know, been over before. Uh, Alright, so uh, kind of a last word on boundary layers before I uh, get into the, uh, the lift and drag. Um, so we, we talked about the idea of laminar versus turbulent boundary layers uh, with internal flows, with pipe flows, right? And with pipe flows, we sort of said, alright, laminar and turbulence depends on the diameter of the pipe, the Reynolds number defined with respect to the width of the pipe. Um, if the pipe was very large or the flow speed was very high, such that the Reynolds number, based on the pipe diameter, was over 4,000. We said it was turbulent. If it was less than about 2,000, we said it was laminar. Um, we have some of the same considerations here. It's still based on Reynolds number. However, we don't have a diameter. You know, this is an external flow. And so we use the Reynolds number defined with respect to the distance measured along uh, a body. In other words, um, if we have a flat plate with incoming uniform flow, and we measure from the leading edge uh, the distance x, and to find the Reynolds number with respect to x measured from the leading distance, then what we get, or the leading edge, then what we get is a 
the Reynolds number increases along the length of the plate, right? It's sort of this march, marching scheme. As you go further downstream, the Reynolds number gets higher and higher and higher. And with that, um, the, uh, if we look at this expression right here, we sort of get that uh, we get that delta 0 0.99 is equal to 5 times x over random number of time with respect to x, which is equal to uh, 5 times the square root of viscosity over write it bigger. Five times square root of viscosity over u times square root of x. Right? In other words, the, the thickness of the boundary layer grows at a decreasing rate um, with respect to the square root of x. However, um, so in this range, the flow is laminar. Um, in, in this range of Reynolds numbers. And for laminar flow, it's fairly well behaved, and we have this exact solution, such as the velocity solution, right? Um, however, at some point, the Reynolds number reaches a critical value, like it does in pipe flow. Um, however, the critical value for flow over external bodies is um, a Reynolds number based on length of about five times 10 to the fifth. This is a, a, this is sort of an estimate. Um, it depends very highly on uh, the geometry of the body, things like how rough the body is, etc., when transition to turbulence occurs. But 5 times 10 to the fifth is kind of middle of the road, rule of thumb uh, value. So once it hits this transitional um, region around like, you know, 10 to the fifth times 10 to the sixth, or, or to 10 to the sixth, um, you'll start to see this, 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 this transitional flow beginning where these fluctuations start popping up. Um, and then downstream, where the Reynolds number is significantly larger than the critical Reynolds number, uh, you'll have a fully turbulent boundary layer. Um, and compared to laminar flows, uh, turbulent flows contain large, this large-scale vorticity, enhanced mixing, this diffusion of things like uh, mass, temperature, um, you know, this mixing. But with that mixing comes diffusion of linear momentum, and as a result, an increased drag. The velocity profile is also much flatter. For example, if we look here, um, a typical laminar profile is shown by the solid line through circles, um, whereas a typical turbulent boundary layer, fully turbulent, is shown by the solid line with the triangles. It's much flatter near the wall, and that's because flow near the wall is dominated by, in this viscous sublayer, if you remember, is dominated by the shear stress, the Newtonian shear stress, and away from the wall, uh, the stresses are due to these turbulent fluctuations or Reynolds stresses. Uh, also, as a result of this enhanced mixing, um, the turbulent boundary layers tend to be much thicker than laminar boundary layers. Uh, and in fact, what we see from experiments and dimensional analysis, um, right, I should say, uh, unlike, so laminar boundary layers, we have this exact solution. Turbulent boundary layers, there is no exact solution because we don't have the theory to get one, right? We, 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 it's an active area of research, but um, there's simply no nice way to, right now, write down from first principles to derive a physics-based set of equations that describe the velocity profile in a turbulent boundary layer. The best we've been able to do, and by we I mean 200 years of fluid dynamicists the world over is to use dimensional analysis and do experiments. Um, and through a lot, a lot, a lot of experiments, um, what has been found is, find it if I can. There we go. Um, that the thickness of a turbulent boundary layer divided by x is approximately 
seven over Reynolds number to the one fifth. Okay. So we can see right now why if, if we say at this point and this point, the Reynolds number is close to five times 10 to the fifth, where it could kind of be laminar or turbulent, either one. If five times 10 to the fifth, um, at the, and if we say the same position, or at the same x position, um, throwing that in here, we're gonna get the square root of five times 10 to the fifth. This, uh, I, I don't know, if it's uh, something in the 10,000 range, no. Sorry, it's going to be something in the hundred, um, around 150 or 200 or something. Um, and five to the ten to the fifth, to the one fifth power is going to be a much smaller number. So having a smaller number in the denominator is going to make this number much larger. Um, so it, this tells us that the turbulent boundary layer is going to be much thicker. Um, so this this insight about how the thickness of turbulent and laminar boundary layers change or are, are related to one another um, is one of the reasons why in model testing, right, when you're testing uh, scale models like in the towing tank, um, this is one of the major issues that, that we have. Um, we know that, that if we have a, a full scale ship, for example, let's say uh, ship model length, um, we have length, uh, velocity, and as a result the Reynolds number. Let's say that um, the ship has a length of 100 meters and the model has a length of 1 meter. Um, if we follow fruit scaling, then what we get is if the ship now has a um, has a velocity of, let's say, Vs for V ship, the model is going to be uh, V, has a, has a, it's going to have a velocity of Vs divided by 10. And then if we plug this velocity and this uh, length into the Reynolds number based on the length of the ship, and we're going to get over here, Reynolds number based on the ship, and we're going to have Reynolds number, um, the ship, divided by 1,000. That is, the Reynolds number is going to be three orders of magnitude smaller for the model than it is on the ship. That means, for a ship, you know, if you, if you look at um, a full-scale uh, ship that's 100 meters long, moving a meter per second, uh, you're already, you're getting here 100 divided by uh, something that's on the order of 10 to the negative 6th. So you already have a Reynolds number up in the 10 to the 7th range, which is way above this critical Reynolds number, so you can expect that you have turbulent flow over the ship hull. Okay? Um, however, if you take out three orders of magnitude, your model is going to have a Reynolds number of something like in the 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 5th range, which means it might have laminar flow. Laminar and turbulent flows look nothing like each other. They have totally different shear stress behaviors, totally different thicknesses. So uh, this is why we use a technique in towing tank tests called turbulent tripping. In other words, they'll put something like some sandpaper at the front of the ship or a couple of little um, bumps along the bow of a model, right? Not, not, not the full-scale ship, but on the model. And it sort of, uh, it, it creates this turbulence at a much smaller Reynolds number. In other words, it, it, it forces the flow to become turbulent even when the Reynolds number is low enough that it would ordinarily be laminar. And by doing this, you know, this has two purposes. One is it makes sure that you, at least you have the same kind of flow over the ship. So there's, there's, there's one of the issues. The second is that Turbulent, Reynolds, or turbulent boundary layers, because the one-fifth power versus the one-half power over here, turbulent boundary layers are less sensitive to the actual uh, Reynolds number. In other words, uh, they, don't, they don't change as quickly with um, changing Reynolds number. And as a result, the fact that these Reynolds numbers between the ship and the model are very different isn't going to have as great an effect on a turbulent boundary layer as it does on a laminar boundary layer. Oh, fantastic. Uh, there we go. All right, so we have only about, um, only really enough time to deal with lift and drag uh, coefficients. So um, moving on from boundary layers, 
we talked before about how flow over bodies creates forces on those, right? Um, essentially, the force on a body in a flow is a result of integrating all the stresses on the body over the surface area of the body. Those stresses come in two flavors, pressure and shear, where pressure is normal to the surface, shear is tangential. Um, and so these, the, the integration of these forces gives us, or these stresses, gives us forces that are um, normal to and parallel to the flow direction, which we call drag and lift. So drag is the force component that is aligned with the direction of flow. That is what wants to you know, drag the body along with the flow, velocity, and lift is the force that's generated normal to the flow direction. So this, you know, that, that, the, the, the conventional lift versus drag should be fairly, um, fairly easy to remember because, uh, you know, you understand the you drag of a body moving through a fluid. For example, um, if this were a plane or a wing, uh, it's moving forward with velocity and you'd hope that the lift would be directed upward. Um, the important thing to remember is that um, lift and drag are defined with respect to the flow, not with respect to the body. Okay, this is a, this is a mistake that um, is easily made. Um, but you, you know, for example, if you were to tip this body back, if you were to rotate it back, um, such as if a plane were climbing, the amount of lift that's generated is still, the idea is for it to still counteract gravity, right, and keep you in the air and therefore it has to be defined positive upward with respect to um, the plane's forward motion. So um, if you know, we, have, we have this lift and we have this drag where both are a result of pressure and shear stresses. Uh, that is to say, if um, we were to integrate the total, um, the total stresses over a body to get the lift, it's going to involve the sine of the pressure component, that is the amount of the pressure component directed upward, um, plus the amount of the shear stress component directed upward, uh, integrated over the area to give us the lift and drag also a combination of pressure and shear stresses. Um, so lift and drag are both dimensional and if we were to plug these into a uh, dimensional analysis and come up with pi terms, you know, these dimensionless pi terms, what we would get is the drag and the lift coefficients, what they're called. Um, I promise this is only another minute or so. Uh, we say the lift coefficient is equal to lift divided by one at rho u squared times a, and cd is equal to drag over one half rho u squared times an area. So uh, it's pretty clear what density is, you know, that's going to be the fluid density, the forward velocity of the body, or the velocity of the fluid relative to the body. The question is, what do we use for the area? So this is the only thing I wanted to point out, um, is that we need to, um, there we go, we need to be mindful of the area that we use. Uh, for drag coefficients, the area is typically the projected frontal area of the body as seen by the flow. For example, if this is a building, it's going to be the width of the building times the height of the building. Okay? If you were to shine a flashlight in the direction of the flow, or if you were to align yourself with the flow and just look at the outline of the building, what is the, what is the area of the two-dimensional outline? Okay? Um, for lift, we're usually interested in um, the the plan form area, so it's called, or the area uh, perpendicular to the flow. So if you were to align yourself with the direction of lift, right, put your position yourself above or below the body, such as that you're looking along the line of action of the force, um, then look at the outline of the body, uh, such as a wing, you would get the length of the wing times the width of the wing, and that's the area that you would use. Um, the one exception to this rule that I want to point out is that for when we're dealing with wings, usually the convention is that they're going to use the same area for lift and drag. That is the plan form. Um, so typically, if you're talking about wings and lift and drag coefficients, um, then you're going to have uh, what's called the span times the chord. 
for both areas. The length of the wing times the, the depth of the wing, the thickness of the wing. Um, so I think on the homework, the drag coefficient problems involve wings. 